Welcome to Westpac's webinar covering dynamic cushion testing for shock absorption and vibration attenuation. This is the fourth in the five series program. If you missed any of the others, you can find them at Westpac's website at www.westpac.com under the webinar tab. I'm Greg Swinghammer, and I'll be your moderator and webinar organizer today. Before we get started, let's take a moment to ensure that everyone is ready and familiar with the webinar control panel. First, you should have a control panel on the upper right side of your screen. You may minimize this panel by clicking on the orange arrow button in the upper left-hand corner. You may expand the panel by clicking on the same button. Secondly, you have the ability to submit questions using the chat pane located near the bottom of the control panel. We will be answering a few questions during the webinar. However, if we can't get to all the questions during the webinar, one of our presenters will follow up with you afterwards. Today's webinar and slide deck should be available at Westpac's website tomorrow. With that, let's get started. Today's presenters are Herb Schooneman and Edmund Tang. Herb is Westpac's president and CEO and a past lecturer at nearby San Jose State University. Edmund is a lab manager here at Westpac and is a current lecturer at San Jose State. Herb, you're our first presenter. Take it away. Thanks, Greg, and welcome all to the fourth of our fifth webinars on packaging dynamics. So in the first uh, three webinars, we covered uh, a substantial amount of information, so we want to review that first. <clears throat> then we're going to define what a cushion system really is. Uh, we're going to talk, first of all, about vibration testing of cushion systems, what, what we can say about that. We're going to talk about shock or impact testing of cushion systems. And we're going to go over a little bit of determining the uh, optimum cushion system after we have that information, selecting a cushion thickness and the correct loading and the ribs and that kind of thing. Uh, finally, we're going to look at other issues involved in cushion fabrication. Uh, so hang on tight. A lot of areas to cover. First webinar, we uh, talked about the uh, history and, and the background of uh, packaging dynamics. <clears throat> we said how important the, uh, the terminology of the trade is, what I call the lingo. And we talked extensively about the time domain versus frequency domain and, and uh, singularity of freedom spring mass systems. Probably if you were sitting in on those, you might have got tired of hearing about those things, but they'll be very important this time. We also uh, defined common package dynamic hazards, including uh, vibration, impact, and also compression, both the static and dynamic. Uh, Edwin, uh, you want to tell us what the other webinar uh, uh, webinar series uh, covered? Definitely. Thank you, Herb. So you've seen this graph probably three or four times now depending on how many webinars you attended. But, you know, a very, very important um, fact that we try to drill into for this webinar is input and response. Because input is what your package or your product sees, and then response is typically what it sees afterwards after you put it in a package to protect it. So on top, you could see a pretty violent, sharp shock and with the high, you know, relatively high G levels of maybe 450. On bottom is if this same unit was being in a package and it reduced that shock by maybe 50% by putting the energy into a longer duration. And that's pretty much how packages protect products in shock or drop testing. So in webinar number two, what we did was we defined the environment. We pretty much told you how to map out your distribution environment. And a little review of that is that when you map out a distribution environment, you're quantifying all the hazards capable of causing damage to the product. Impacts come to mind because it's a, you know, most things break with impacts you think about. And when you drop a product, when you drop a package from drop height, there's going to be a certain drop height or drop range that damages your product or how many, num how many drops you see and what, what orientations. For vibration, people don't really think about vibration too much just because it's so subtle. But then with vibration, um, it always occurs in the distribution environment. You can never avoid vibration. So you definitely want to know what frequencies can damage your product. Temperature and humidity extremes, whether you're going cold, hot, humid, or dry, all that should be quantified as well. Top load compression, either vehicle stacking or warehouse stacking, but nonetheless, it's compression that your box is seeing and your product is seeing and altitude, which is pretty much the maximum altitude exposed, whether that's in an aircraft or in a truck during shipment. So when we look at these sources of information, there's a couple things you could do. 
the best option is direct measurement of the distribution environment. And with this measurement, what you do is that you take a ride recorder and you stick it into a box or into a truck, and then it records every single input that occurs during a distribution environment. So you know the number of drops that occurred, you also know the orientation, and you also know the height. Same thing for vibration, you know your frequency ranges and pretty much your overall um, PSD or energy of that vibration. You could also do literature search or historical records, and surprisingly, you could actually just Google um, some distribution studies and you'll come up with quite a few, and we went over that in the other webinar number two as well. Observation is a little tricky because you have to catch um, the culprit in action, like for instance, you see a box and it dropped from four feet, and then you have to look at it and say, okay, and if you're not there at that point, then the observation is done. So observation is always you know, not really advised. And damage claims is when at the end of the transportation, you look at your percentages and say, okay, we have 5% damage. And then you try to figure out you know, where this damage came from. Other concerns is obviously to collect all this data with direct measurement, it's going to cost money. And also it's going to be timely because you have to have enough measurements to actually say that, okay, we fully mapped out our distribution environment. We did 30 trips and we pretty much covered all our bases. And then also the validity of the data because sometimes your package gets abused or you know something just an anomaly happens, like a forklift runs into your package. And you definitely don't want to pretty much um, be too concerned with that because it's an anomaly and it's almost abuse. So Herb's going to talk about webinar number three now. Thanks, Edmund. In webinar number three, we talked about product fragility or sensitivity. And I mentioned during that webinar that this is the heart and soul of packaging dynamics. We really have to understand the sensitivity of our products to uh, shock and vibration inputs, among other things. Don't ignore temperature and humidity and, and compression, those kind of things. But we're going to focus on uh, shock and vibration. So that's what we did uh, during this uh, uh, webinar number three. Um, you're probably familiar with this uh, bar chart, and uh, it was the the uh, brainchild of uh, Mr. Mr. Bill Kipp. Some of you know Bill. He's a what I consider to be one of the geniuses in the business. And so what we're, we uh, we we try to say with this bar chart is that you can quantify the the, the elements necessary to design a protective package system. You can quantify the environment. We did that in webinar number two. Uh, webinar number three, we quantified the product. Uh, sensitivities and then in webinar uh, uh, this particular webinar number four we're going to quantify this uh, this package system so we, we, we put numbers on these things so that we can actually deal with them so uh, that's in essence what we're going to try to do uh, we'll talk a little bit about those other three bars uh, uh, in the next webinar when we talk about the uh, optimum package design before we start the process, it's, it's really necessary to define some key terms, and those three terms that I pulled out are cushion, static loading, and uh, call it linear, nonlinear. Basically, uh, we'll, we'll define each of these now. And, and cushion system is really a cushion is nothing more than a device that uh, uh, that gives, it compresses, or or somehow uh, expands. It will deflect in response to an applied dynamic load. So cushions work in compression, they work in tensile, they work in torsion or shear or any other spring mode. So don't think that a cushion has to be a piece of foam. It can be almost anything. Uh, the second term, probably the most important one, I think, is uh, static loading. It's simply the, the weight d divided by the area. Uh, if you don't have a right rectangular prism, in other words, a solid block, it's hard to determine area, but but uh, you, you still have to somehow determine the load that you're placing on the spring, normally expressed in pounds per square inch in the English systems or grams per, per square centimeter, typically in the metric system. But uh, to give you uh, just a reference, most commonly used cushion materials, in other words, uh, polymeric foams, uh, function best uh, in the loading range of approximately a half to a two psi, depending on your application. But that's really what we're looking for; those kind of kind of ranges. Okay. Let's just uh, take some examples so that you thoroughly understand this concept of static loading. Suppose we have a a, a product that weighs 20 pounds, and we uh, rest it on a cushion with a square with a hundred square inches, 10 by 10 cushion, for example. Well, then you'd have 20 pounds divided by 100 square inches, or 0.2 
pounds per square inch psi well okay let's suppose that we take away half of that cushion so now we have 20 pounds on half the cushion or 50 square inches so we have 20 pounds divided by 50 square inches or 0.4 pounds per square inch psi okay well let's suppose that we uh, increase the weight of the product by two and a half times the same cushion area okay then we wind up with uh, 50 pounds over a 50 square inch cushion when we have 50 over 50 or one psi so that's that's it's really quite simple um, you can also use static loading to uh, determine uh, a little bit about you know the area of the cushion that you actually need for example let's say that uh, that you know uh, that, that your product has a a, a certain uh, uh, static or has a certain uh, weight for sure and a certain area so you say well if I cover that uh, entire thing uh, let's see I want to somehow use 0.75 psi as my desired static loading because that the literature says that's the best so how many square inches do I actually need winds up being about 63 square inches for this particular uh, example so 47 pound product with a 0.7 psi loading so you see you can work that that formula either way and that's going to wind up being very important to us later on it turns out that static stress loading is the primary tool that we can use to optimize most cushion systems so we want to make sure that everyone understands the concept of static load okay the uh, third a uh, lingo uh, piece or term that I want you to be uh, aware of is uh, uh, the term of a linear or nonlinear cushion. And basically all this means is that the uh, the stress strain curve is either straight or it isn't straight. <laughs> that's that's what it amounts to. So I, I show here a force deflection curve for a cushion. And in this particular case, the force and deflection uh, plot a linear uh, uh, line, uh, which basically means if I double the force, uh, then I'll double the deflection okay now some cushions work as a, a linear spring and some don't uh, we're going to talk about that later because uh, using nonlinear cushion dynamics winds up being a, a pretty cool tool uh, later on okay um, so let's start the the the, the concept of uh, uh, vibration dynamics with the vibration I'm sorry cushion dynamics or uh, packaging dynamics we're going to talk about the vibration characteristics of cushions so I mentioned earlier cushions are essentially springs and then uh, we can analyze them as a spring mass system suppose that we have a, a mass on a spring as we explained earlier uh, we have a spring mass system with uh, with the characteristics that you see here suppose that we excite this system from the base and we measure the input and the response and uh, you know, plot that as a function of the frequency we'll see that uh, for a certain mass on a certain stiffness of spring, that's the K value, uh, we're going to get a specific transmissibility plot. So all cushion systems have this characteristic. Okay. What we're really interested in here is the damping, because damping is the primary cushioning function. And, and damping really is a, uh, basically it means the uh, resistance to motion after the excitation is removed. Many of you are familiar with damping devices. For example, the shock absorbers on your car are basically a damping device so that uh, your wheel doesn't continue to bounce after the car uh, passes over the bump. Okay. So what we're really interested in here is what, what we call the dynamic spring rate of the cushion. And this is how we determine it. In the last uh, webinar, we mentioned that, uh, uh, that products also have vibration sensitivity. And we do a very similar test there. We simply excite them and then we measure responses of critical components okay so now we need to determine the cushion vibration characteristics because uh, if we do it wrong we can actually design a cushion that can destroy the product and th that's happened many times uh, if you happen to design the cushion right where the product is sensitive from a vibration standpoint you got a dead product that's just there's no way of way around it um, to start the process, uh, it's uh, interesting to note that there have been several uh, procedures recommended over the years for developing cushion vibration curves. These are often referred to as amplification slash attenuation plots. It's kind of a, a tongue twister type of name, but a uh, few of us had figured out a better name. 
So there's uh, several methods of, the, of doing this. Uh, one is, re is referred to as the so-called guided test block method. So this block in the middle of those rollers is allowed to uh, freely move up and down. It's restrained in the X and Y axes. And then you simply uh, can add weights to the inside of the block to change the static loading. You know what that is now. And you measure with accelerometers the input and the response. So this is, uh, this is the way things were done uh, 20 or 30 years ago when I started th the process. There's another method that, uh, that you see here I refer to as the alternate method. And uh, it's a little simpler and uh, it gives a, a little more consistent result. And there are two variations to this alternate method. Sometimes you use a cushion uh, glued to the surface of a big pallet, for example. Suppose that you're shipping a 300 or 600 pound unit and you have it uh, secured to the uh, deck of a what's referred to as a floating deck pallet. Well, that's where you have a piece of plywood typically glued to a piece of cushion that is also glued to the base of the pallet. And, uh, and that, so the cushion in that particular situation functions in both tension and compression. There's another model uh, called the compression compression model. You see that on the right here. And uh, it, uh, it basically... Uh, restrains the top and bottom cushion and allows the mass in between them to freely move between the two cushions so that in this particular case the mass will compress the cushions uh, in compression only. So we call that the compression compression model or the CC model. Uh, you, you'll see that there's a, a provisions for both an input accelerometer and a response accelerometer in both these cases. And uh, that's, that's important because that's how we get the data that we're looking for. Okay. Um, in case you think this is uh, rocket science, uh, on the left-hand side you see a sketch of the uh, uh, block that we actually use here at Westpac to develop this information. And so conceptually that's what it looks like. It's a, just a rectangular block with a cushion above and below it. Uh, it's inside of a square box and that box has a, uh, actually it's a square tube. And there's a box inside the tube that, uh, into which you can add weight or ballast weights, as you can see here, uh, along with the response accelerometer. So you simply place that system on the table of a shaker and uh, measure the input and response as a function of frequency, and you've got the data that you're looking for. On the right side, you see a, a kind of a sketchy. It's actually pretty old, too, but it still works. But that's what the system looks like when it's applied to a shaker. This happens to be an electrodynamic shaker. Uh, but it really doesn't matter. The box doesn't know who's shaking it. It just knows it's shaking. So that's what the system looks like, and that's uh, how it works. In both cases, um, the result is what's referred to as a transmissibility plot. And this basically shows uh, the uh, excitation, the response input ratio, which, which is on the, uh, the vertical axis, as a function of frequency on the horizontal axis. And you can see that this particular system starts out at low frequency and the response input ratio is one. And there's your response is equal to the input. As the frequency is increased, you'll see that eventually uh, this system reaches a peak, uh, about 30 hertz in this particular case, a response of almost 10 times the input. And then uh, as you continue to increase the frequency, the response decreases and uh, starts to attenuate they're at about uh, 45, 44 hertz or so, and continues to attenuate from that, that point on. So this is a very typical uh, transmissibility plot, and this is what we're looking for. Now I'm going to ask Edmund to uh, take it from here and explain what the significance of that is and how we actually go about uh, uh, plotting that data. Edmund? Thanks for that clear explanation, Herb. So do you remember last webinar when we were plotting transmissibility plots? What was one thing that we were just trying to drive into you, grill into you? I think that was, what is resonance? Why is it important? Well, resonance is important because it's a characteristic of all structures, all spring mass systems, everything that you're working with, where the response to the vibration input is much greater than the input itself. So we have in big bold letters there, response is greater than input. That's what we're looking for. So if you look at this photograph here, it's pretty much a ruler attached to a table. But this ruler, you know, you look at it, the table isn't really moving much, but the ruler is moving significantly more. And you could think of that as an amplification of maybe more than 50 times because uh, if you compare pretty much the right side and left side, 
it's almost 50 times the input is less than the response, or so the response is greater than the input. And that's what breaks your units during vibration. So some more review, I think this was webinar number one, um, is vibration dynamics, important regions. So as her pointed out in the transmissibility plot, you begin with one-to-one -one coupling, and that's when your response is equal to your input, and your amplification is just equal to one, or you know, a little more than one. Amplification is when your response starting starts to become more than your input, and your Q is greater than one, and this is when damage occurs. So if you look at the graph on bottom, um, we have this red line, and that's known as your resonant frequency or your natural frequency, and that's the highest point of the graph. And then the last section or the last region is the attenuation region where the response is lowest than your input. So Q is less than one, and that's where you ideally want your product's natural frequency to be in a package. So with regards to um, vibration dynamics and how do we evaluate different cushion systems and different static loadings? So how do you actually build an amplification attenuation plot to design a package? Well, the way you do that is that you load your cushion at a specific loading utilizing the fixture previously described. And then you excite your cushion with vibration. And then you identify your three important regions from the transmissibility plot, which we just went through, one-to-one, -one, amplification, and attenuation. And then finally, you repeat that for all static loadings. And typically, it's a minimum of five static loadings that we test to. So if you were to overlay every single static loading that you um, tested for on a plot, this is kind of sort of what it would look like. So this is six static loadings from 0.33 PSI all the way up to 2 PSI. So first thing that you would look for, and first thing that always occurs in vibration, is one-to-one. -one. So when we look at where one-to-one -one ends, this is where it's kind of sort of, you could say, lifting off. So in this region, all six plots are around, um, you know, around the same area, say at least. But where one to one end isn't too important. What's more important is your resonant frequencies, and that's where damage occurs, and that's the point that you definitely want to document for every single loading. And then lastly, you're going to look at the attenuation zone, and again, that's when Q, which is your response over your input, is less than one. And that's where your quote unquote vibration protection begins. So again, this is three distinct zones on six different plots and static loadings. So when you actually do a test, you actually will get one plot at one time, and then you would take your values accordingly. So looking at these three plots, we make something, or we point pick your three important regions to plot what is known as an amplification attenuation plot, or an AA plot. So if you look at this graph here, or this plot here, starting from the left side, this is the 0.33 loading here. So you can see that one-to-one -one was right there. Then it hit amplification at around just shy of 60 hertz. And then finally, it hit the attenuation zone around 120 hertz. So you kind of sort of do that for every single static loading that we have. And then you make a best fit line and that is what is shown here. Mm. So what's important is that you never really want to load your product into the amplification zone because, again, once again, that's where damage occurs. You always want to be into the attenuation zone. So what does that mean for those people designing products? Let's go with a real-life example here. So if our product is a futuristic robot that has a fragile, com fragile component with a resonant frequency of 70 hertz, how do we use this data? So on the left-hand side here, we have kind of sort of some small cheat sheets and some notes. So the first thing that I would do is that I would draw a horizontal line at the resonant frequency that you're trying to protect against. And that occurs right there, so at 70 hertz. That's a 70 hertz line. And then second is that you would look at the usable range of the cushion, and this is where your line falls into the attenuation zone. So with these lines here, so you know that Anytime you're loading from around maybe 0.8 PSI to 2 PSI, you're in the attenuation zone. And then so what that means is that if you load your product in your package at this static loading, you should be quote unquote protected because once again, you're in the attenuation zone. And that takes us to our first break for the questions and answer session. 
Greg, are there any questions from the audience? Um, Edmund, no, we don't have any questions right now, but everybody, please remember, feel free to send questions in throughout the webinar, and we'll answer them uh, when we get a chance to. Uh, and if you think of anything after the webinar, you can shoot us an email after the webinar. So thanks, everybody. Back to you. Thank you, Greg. Now going on with this presentation here, next we have impacts or shock for cushion systems. So what is impact or shocks? Well, it's characteristic measured using instrumented impacts resulting in what is known as a cushion curve. Typical procedures to characterize cushions is or are ASTM D1596, ASTM D4168, and MIL standard 26514E. So much like vibration, yes, yeah, same thing. Question, how do we build a cushion curve plot to design a package for shock? So first thing you would do is that you would load your cushion at the specific loading. You would impact or shock your cushion and record the peak deceleration in G levels. You definitely would want to throw out the first value because in the distribution environment, you're never going to be working with fresh foam that's never been dropped before. So you could say that the first value is very unrealistic but then you'll take the next four values, values and then you would average them. Then you would repeat for the other static loadings. Typically, minimum of five static loadings are used. And then you would also repeat for other thicknesses, if desired, and this is optional. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. So on the right, we have a photograph of the cushion tester, and then next we have actually a video of a shock or impact would look like. So as you could tell, this is slowed down a little bit, just so everyone can see it in a clear, concise fashion. But we have a weight, which is the platinum weight right there, and then we raise it up. And then after you reach your design drop height of where you want to test, then your the cushion tester would pretty much release the weight onto the cushion. And then you would take your deceleration, and then you would record the peak G levels. So here it is again. So at the end of the day, what kind of curve are you building? What does it look like after you've done all your you know, due diligence with all the static loadings? So you would do build a curve that looks something like this. And what this curve does is that it describes the amount of acceleration, or again, I said deceleration, transmitted through a given thickness of material as a function of static stress loading on the cushion and the drop height. So just like the vibration, um, transmissibility, uh, amplification, attenuation plots, you're taking your points and then you're giving what is known as the best fit line to connect the dots, to say the least. So right here on this curve, we have a two inch foam, a three inch foam, and a four inch foam, and then loaded in the same static loadings as the vibration plots. So this cushion curve shows the peak acceleration on the vertical axis and the static stress on the horizontal axis. Remember, static stress is equal to weight over bearing area. Each curve is drawn from a minimum of five test points, once again, and the average of the last four is taken and plotted onto the plot, as you see there. So when you look at your cushion curves, what you notice is that on the left side, it's, you know, your values are relatively high. And you ask yourself, OK, why is that? What's the physics behind that? What's the reasoning behind that? And the reason why is because the left side of the curve, the object does not have su sufficient force or mass to deflect the cushion and therefore resembles dropping a product onto a rigid surface. And this is known as an underloaded cushion, short pulse duration with high deceleration levels. I think um, actually Herb likes to use an example of throwing a baby onto a hard bed with this um, underloaded example here. But that's pretty much a really, really good example of underloaded cushions. In the middle of the curve, we have what is known as properly loaded. And that's the center of the curve. I like to call it the sweet spot of the curve. But at the center of the curve, the object has sufficient force to deflect the cushion. And what that means is that it's optimally loaded and it gives you a longer pulse duration with deceleration levels relatively low, or it's the best you could get, to say the least. And then if you use the bed example, it's like a normal sized person onto a normal bed. Lastly, with the overloaded, on the right side of the curve, the object has way too much force or mass and results in the continuing right through of the cushion and therefore bottoming out the cushion so it can't deflect anymore. So if you remember with our material, 
depending on what you're using, they could deflect anywhere from probably 50% to 80%. But once you deflect did everything that you can, your cushion becomes hard and it's almost the same as the impact surface or the rigid surface now. And it's the overloaded cushion and it gives you a longer pulse, but then it has a sudden deceleration because the cushion suddenly becomes hard and stiffens and therefore doesn't protect the product anymore. So if you were to take anything out of it, it's definitely, it is desirable to use the cushions in the lower portion or the belly of the curve where performance is optimum. When the product when the product's critical acceleration, weight, design, drop height are known, the usable static stress range of the cushion area can be determined for a given material and thickness. So if you ask me what's the belly of the curve, what's the lower point, what's the sweet spot, I would say it's somewhere kind of sort of between there with, you know, depending on where you actually want to load, there's definitely some leeway and some slack, but that's a good rule of thumb to say. Okay, now again, we have another example. So if our product is once again a futuristic laser this time that has a fragile component with a critical acceleration of 70 Gs, how do you use this data? So once again, on the left-hand side, we have a nice little cheat sheet of what to do. What I would do is that I would draw a horizontal line at the critical acceleration, which is 70 Gs. So you draw a line right there, and then it cuts off quite a few things. So what your first thing that you notice is that you can't use the two inch foam at all because every single reading on the two inch foam is above 70 Gs. So if you use a two inch foam, that means you're asking for your product to be broken during the distribution environment. So that leaves us the three inch foam and the four inch foam. So if you're diligent with the three inch foam, you could actually load it. And it's not that bad actually. It's probably from 0.7 PSI to 1.2 PSI around there. But then that's if you're diligent. If you want to have a little more slack, you could use the four inch foam, but at the same time, you're wasting a lot of materials here. But with that, you could load it anywhere from a little shy of 0.5 to almost all 1.5. So these are the ranges of how you would um, determine where to load your product with a 70 G critical acceleration value. And next, Herb's gonna take it away with selecting cushion thicknesses. Thanks, Edmund. I hope you're all taking notes and that you all, all absorb that. <laughs> That's exactly why we publish these uh, uh, webinar uh, slides on our website, because you can go back and, and find out. Uh, so rather than scratch your head and, and wear out the pen and all that kind of stuff or get frustrated, just remember that all this information will be available to you. So to summarize a little bit, right now we have all the information necessary to select the proper loading, static stress loading, for both vibration uh, attenuation or vibration protection of the product and for shock protection of the product. Remember in webinar number three, we determined exactly what those levels were, uh, the, the critical levels for the product. And now we know exactly how to determine similar characteristics for the cushion. So the object is to combine those two. And we're gonna talk more about this in the last webinar, but there's a couple of points that I want to make sure you're aware of before we get to that point. The first thing is that, that uh, we, after you have all your information, you have to select the cushion thickness. Okay, so Edmund gave a pretty good example, and he said you could select uh, either a, a three inch thick or a four inch thick material. But if you remember that curve, uh, you could actually select a 2.7 inch thick material if you could select the exact correct loading. So if you really have to optimize a cushion, that's exactly how you do it. And so what we're going to do is offer a, a couple of guidelines here that have, have uh, done me well over the years. And the first is that, that you have to estimate how much cushion deflection you really need. And you can do a reasonably good job of that with this little formula, delta X, which is a change in dimensions, in this case thickness, is equal to 2H over uh, A minus 2. H is the drop height, and uh, A is the acceleration or deceleration level that you're looking for for the product. So, for example... Uh, you could uh, that tell tell almost any kind of deflection necessary in in, uh, in uh, the 70 G example that that uh, uh, Edmund used. Uh, your your actual deflection is going to be just a, a little bit less than uh, three inches. Uh, 2.8 was the number I came up with. So remember that this is the theoretical deflection, not the overall cushion thickness. <clears throat> and and the reason I mention that is that most Cushions, and especially polymeric foams, which are the vast majority of cushions, will compress somewhere between 40 and 60% before they start to bottom out. Remember, uh, 
Edmund told us about that. That's the right side of the uh, impact cushion curve or, or shock curve. So uh, various materials have different uh, rates at which they will compress and different percentages that they will compress before they bottom out. Um, the, the, if you're on a, a cushioned chair right now, the chances are pretty good you're sitting on top of polyurethane foam. It's the softest uh, stuff available for the most part. And it will compress up to 80%, depending on the exact thickness and foam formulation, before it starts to bottom out. So different materials uh, have different numbers. On the other extreme, some of you are familiar with uh, polystyrene, often referred to as uh, styrofoam. And most of the time, it can only compress somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40, maybe 50%. Again, depending on its design, before it starts to bottom out. Okay. First thing we should remember. Um, let's go through an example. I think it, it probably says a, a lot here and it shows you the usage of the data. Let's assume we have a 50G a product, 50G fragility product, and a design drop height of 35 inches. Okay, so first of all, let's, let's de determine the theoretical deflection, and that's calculated from that same formula, delta x equals 2h over g minus 2. So in this particular case, uh, using the uh, using metric numbers, uh, the theoretical deflection winds up being about uh, 3.75 centimeters for that particular application. So the total thickness uh, would be determined from, uh, let's say we had uh, a, a polyurethane foam, as I mentioned before, where it'll compress about 70%. You can see in the bottom of that table at the, at the bottom end of the, the system uh, right here, you can see that uh, we're going to need about of 5.4 centimeters or about 2.1 inches. So you can dial, by using this formula, you can, you can dial in the exact thickness uh, pretty darn close, which is kind of neat. Um, the next thing you, you have to do is once you determine the optimum uh, thickness of material, you have to determine the optimum static loading. And uh, again, we went through that before. Uh, it's determined from the cushion curve for shock and the amplification attenuation plot for a vibration. And any portion of the curve that lies below uh, the uh, uh, on the shock curve will define a static loading capable of transmitting less than the, this so-called critical acceleration to the product for a given drop height. Now, it should be obvious to you that static stress then really involves the area or the amount of cushion that you use. So if you want to minimize that, which is the most cost-effective thing to do, you normally want to load the foam to the highest static stress loading allowed by the curve. That will minimize your cushions, uh, your cushion area. Okay. Here's a here's an example of how that works. Let's suppose that we have this uh, again the, uh, the the 70 G's uh, 70 hertz rather uh, and 70 G's from the uh, example that Edmund used on his uh, robot, super robot. So the first thing we need to do is figure out, okay, what kind of loading do we need for vibration protection? And look at that. We need to be uh, attenuating by 70 hertz, and that's going to require static loading of at least 0.9 PSI in this particular plot. Okay. Now the next thing we have to do is oh, 0.8. Okay, I'll, I'll accept that. Um, <laughs> the next thing we need to do is, is to figure out the, uh, the shock loading. Okay, so for the shock loading, we said uh, hmm, 70 Gs right there. So that means we're going to have to use a material uh, that's going to be uh, for three inches. It's got to be at least uh, like 0 0.65, uh, 0 0.66 there, all the way up to uh, 1.33 psi. Okay, but but we have to to make sure we get both vibration and impact requirements in the same cushion. Can't just select them both. So the range that we actually need is between this uh, uh, 0.8, roughly, and uh, the 1.33. So that, that, that defines the range that we can use. So if we're trying to minimize the amount of, of uh, cushion that we actually are going to use, we would use the highest range. So we would load the cushion at 1.33 pounds per square inch. So that is probably the, uh, the best combination of, of curves that you'll see for that particular topic. So it shows you exactly how you combine these two, okay? Um, there are times when you'll do this curve and, and you won't be able to resolve 
uh, for both shock and vibration. Sometimes they, they don't overlap. That's happened before. So in a case like that, um, I would definitely urge people to err on the side of vibration protection. And the reason is that it's 100% certain it's going to happen because uh, unless your customer is next door, you're going to be shipping this thing. Uh, so it's 100% certain. And the results of shipping can be disastrous, even if you don't uh, see them as uh, readily as, as uh, impacts. And impacts are a probability function. Sometimes you'll get them, sometimes you won't. Uh, but vibration is a certainty. So uh, I would certainly uh, err on the side of doing the vibration uh, protection first if there is a conflict. Okay. Um, another point to remember is, is that uh, there are different procedures for running cushion curves. And sometimes they can have a significant effect on what you're doing. So make sure that, that you understand that, what that effect is. And then finally, the use of ribs, um, which we're going to talk about next, can have a very positive result in the design effectiveness. This is a, a pretty good uh, photograph of, on the, the left of a ribbed cushion design. So you can see that there are peaks on this cushion that will contact the outside of the container first before the, the rest of the cushion is employed. And, and we call that a, a ribbed or a non-linear cushion design. And that's a, as opposed to the one we see on the right where the cushions are all right rectangular prisms. And so you have this more or less linear relationship between the, uh, the mass and the spring. So just so that the, we include that just so you get an idea of what in the world I mean when I'm talking about non-linear cushions. So here's some guidelines in the use of them. Uh, so the, the, the depth of the rib, in other words, the height of the rib should be approximately uh, one half to two thirds of total cushion thickness. So let's say you have a total cushion thickness of three inches. So you want the the height of the rib to be about uh, an inch and a half to maybe two inches uh, above the, uh, the uh, above the the, the non rib section of, of the cushion. And so the cross sectional area at zero deflection, in other words, where the cushion actually touches, in this case, the box, that should yield a static uh, loading of at least twice. Uh, the optimum loading. So if your optimum loading is 1.33, this area should give you at least uh, 2.6 uh, to 2.7, maybe even as much as 3 PSI. Okay, So you want it to be loaded fairly heavy at the peak of the rib. And then the cross-sectional area at 25% uh, deflection should be approximately equal to that uh, given to what, what we're looking for. In other words, this, this particular case, 1.33 uh, PSI. You see here on the uh, peaked rib that uh, at zero uh, deflection, you have a very high loading because you have virtually no area. As you compress at 25%, so that's this area right here, you see that you want about 25% of your, uh, well, up to, up to what, what did I say, half to two-thirds of the loading. And then by the time you get to the 50% level, you want to be above uh, or at the required loading. Uh, the same thing holds true with this trapezoidal shaped rib and a similar thing holds true with this hemispherical shaped rib. Okay, So that gives you an idea of what I'm talking about in terms of the area. So if this uh, is that this rib here is uh, deflected 50 percent, you want that area there to be about uh, you know, two thirds the static loading of your optimum design. Okay, So that gives you about the shape that you need on the rib. Next slide. So most rib designs uh, are trapezoidal in cross section. So the example I showed showed uh, mostly uh, trapezoidal shaped ribs. Um, I don't want to leave the impression that that's the best design from a theoretical standpoint. Uh, this uh, pyramidal cross section is, is good. And so is a hemispherical cross section uh, from a theoretical standpoint. Here's the most important thing. The vibration response of a cushion can be substantially altered and almost always improved through the use of ribs. So if you run into that situation where you can't get a loading that uh, will give you both good impact and vibration performance, then the use of ribs is uh, almost always a good idea. Um, and the reason is that the, the high static loading at the peak of the rib will result in a lower natural frequency. Uh, you can see that from the amplification attenuation plots. Uh, also remember that the, uh, the force levels associated with vibration are very small. By that I mean it's be pretty rare to get a half a G 
uh, in a truck bouncing down the road. So you don't have these high acceleration levels of the inputs, uh, and therefore the cushion deflection is relatively small, which is why you don't need a whole lot of, uh, of deflection in order to do the, do the job effectively. And also, uh, try to design your package so that the deflection occurs at the, uh, at the peak of the rib, which it always will, but if you put that away from the product, in other words, at the interface of the cushion and the box, uh, then you're going to have a much more stable cushion design than if you put that rib uh, against the product, for example, against the, the interface between the, the product and the cushion. So um, it's, it will have the same influence either way from a theoretical standpoint, but from an integrity standpoint, it makes a lot more sense to have the rib uh, compress uh, at the interface of the box and the cushion rather than at the interface of the cushion and the product. Okay. All right. So that's um, uh, enough for the, uh, the actual design. We're going to get into that more in the final webinar. Um, there are some other issues involved in fabricating cushions that I do want to go over. The first one is uh, sustainability. In other words, uh, don't make a, a, a system that you can't take apart to recycle. All of these materials, all these polymetric materials are, are uh, imminently recyclable and, unless you start gluing them to corrugated or to another piece of foam or something like that. So if you can design without glue, you're much better off from a sustainability standpoint. And remember that the, uh, the highest yield is always equal to the lowest cost. And by that, I mean most of these products are cut out of, of uh, uh, you know, big sheets and the fabricators know the best way to get the highest amount of yield out of them. And so I normally rely on them to do the actual you know, design from a, from a yield standpoint. Um, and so I don't, don't shy away from these people because they, they sure have a wealth of knowledge about uh, how the heck to design with a lot of these cushion systems. Also, you'll, you'll uh, probably are already aware the cushions are very bulky. Uh, that's, that's, how they, how, that's how they do the job. They have to compress. So if you have a, a bulky system and you're, holding, you're trying to move around a lot of this stuff, you're moving around a lot of air or storing a lot of air. So anytime you can create cushion systems that, that nest together uh, before they're actually using the product, uh, much, much better from a storage standpoint. Uh, people will like you a whole lot better. Also, um, with uh, rectangular products, most of the time uh, it's very uh, easy and convenient to put corner uh, corner pads or some sort of corner protection on them, um, but don't don't uh, ignore the actual corner itself. So what I call void corners are a big source of damage, and the reason is that most impacts occur on the corners of a package. So make sure that the corners of the product package system properly protect the product. Okay, uh, so don't ignore the corners. Um, I know some people will actually reject cushion designs with void corners in them. Other issues uh, that I'd like to bring to your attention, we're not going to dwell on them now, but different cushion test procedures will result in different design data. And uh, I, I hinted at that, but I didn't get into it very much. It's really not our purpose during this webinar, but just understand that different test techniques will give you different results. Uh, and also, uh, different pack, finished package test procedures will likewise give you uh, different results. You can do a drop test on a, a free fall drop tester, but uh, you know, if you don't get the, the drop exactly flat, you're going to have different results. Um, other issues, uh, deformable cushion systems, which are very popular these days, are harder to evaluate than the rebounding uh, cushion, foam cushion systems that we've been talking about. But they can be evaluated the same way using the same procedures. In other words, loading divided by the area or the stiffness of the cushion. Uh, similar design evaluations can be used for almost any kind of cushion system. That's the point. Okay. So that's the end of our uh, webinar on uh, the evaluation of cushion systems. And I hope it's been uh, informative. I know it's been a lot of data, so I, I apologize for that. Uh, during the next webinar, we're going to talk about uh, uh, the actual design of a package system. And finally, uh, we're going to spend a lot of time on the test of a product package system. So that's what we got in store for you. I hope it's been a, a good wild ride up to this point and uh, we're not done yet. So uh, Greg, are there any questions from the audience at the end of that? Um, Herb, yeah, thank you. We do have a few and Edmund, thanks for that fine presentation. Uh, the first question, how do you account for compressive creep of some cushion materials such as EPE 
when designing a cushion a cushion system with ribs? Uh, maybe I can handle that. This is Herb. Um, there are materials that creep badly, and uh, the polyolefins, of which uh, uh, EPE, uh, expanded polyethylene, is one of them. Uh, so if you overload it, it will creep over time. In other words, it uh, with a load on it, the static load, it will compress or lose its thickness over time. And uh, g generally, what we found is that uh, within the the uh, normal static loading, what the uh, range, what Edmund referred to as the sweet spot, uh, that the compressive creep winds up being uh, fairly uh, nominal, minimal. Uh, you can verify that by looking at the compressive creep data and finding a loading for which you get, uh, I think it's a thousand hours or 42 days of data, uh, less than 10% of creep. And uh, normally it takes a uh, fairly substantial loading for that. Not always. Um, this expanded polyethylene mentioned uh, by the uh, questioner uh, is uh, uh, rather notorious for creeping because it's not a closed cell material, it's an open cell material which tend to creep uh, worse than uh, closed cell materials. But the way you do that is to simply select a loading that uh, is not going to give you more than 10% creep, which is the generally accepted industry guideline. Um, also, uh, if you tend to a power house for long periods of time, which normally is not Very, uh, then a huge stack of, uh, of uh, television sets that just weren't selling because they had stocked up on CRT designs when the flat screens were coming in, and all those all those cushion systems were creeping badly, and so and the stacks were all listing badly as well. So it's an issue, but the way to do it is to simply not load the cushion where the uh, static creep exceeds 10%. Uh, Greg, any other questions? Um, we do have another one that kind of leads in from that question. Does this work for, or does the um, cushion design work for things like wire rope, thermoform trays, suspension packs, or molded pulp materials? Wow, excellent question. Um, and the answer is yes. The, the general procedure for designing cushions does work. Now, the thing that falls down, obviously, is static loading because this is weight over unit area. If you've got a wire rope, it's pretty hard to define the unit area. Same thing with a, uh, a molded pulp uh, and uh, thermoforms, things like that. Those are crushable systems. and they, But they are very load dependent. So as you increase the loading on that cushion and subject it to either vibration or impact, you will get changed data. So it, it takes some creativity in the uh, uh, process of developing these curves, but the same thing applies. Uh, but instead of static stress, which requires an area, you simply put load and, and create the, the same way. But the, the same procedures occur, and, and you'll see uh, virtually the same data in terms of uh, both vibration and shock response. Um, a little, little more complex getting there, but uh, the same basic process occurs. Uh, Greg, uh, any more? Um, yeah, another one here. Uh, how does the first drop versus the average two through five impact data vary? I'll take that question. So when you're looking at cushion curves, when you're doing shock or drops for deceleration, um, once again, the first drop is unrealistic because in the distribution environment, you never really have a pristine untouched cushion. So therefore, you throw away the first um, value. But if you're actually looking at um, actual numbers that you're looking at, um, just from testing experience and looking at published cushion curves from suppliers and cushion suppliers, like I just said, um, the difference between the first drop and the average of two to five drops is anywhere usually from less than um, by 10 to 20%, it seems like. So just an example, if your average from two to five drops is 50 Gs, then the first drop will probably be anywhere from 40 to 45 Gs, to say the least. Great. Oh. Let me uh, let me add on to that. Uh, when when the standard for developing cushion curves was first set up in the uh, gosh 60s and 70s, most cushions, uh, or many of them, were fabricated by means of die cutting. 
if you're familiar with the die cutting procedure, basically you squeeze the foam down to nothing and, it, and then you get the shape that you're cutting out of the foam. And uh, the result was that the, the cushion material was pre-worked. In other words, it was squeezed pretty darn hard the first time. So your, your cushion design had already had some, some uh, dynamic loading onto it. So the thought was, well, if that's the case, then that's going to pretty much uh, duplicate a first impact on the, on the uh, cushion testing, which uses virgin material. It's not pre-worked. Uh, so uh, many people thought that that was a good idea to throw out that first data. Now, there's a lot of cushions for which that doesn't apply. If you have an intimate wrap, for example, um, loose fill material, some polystyrene molded cushions, uh, a lot of those things, you should accept the first data because that's exactly what's going to happen. In fact, the data from the environment tells us that the package system is likely to receive uh, a, a, an impact from the design drop height only once, not five times only once. So sometimes the first impact data is very, very relevant and crucial, and sometimes it isn't. You just have to evaluate that from the actual type of cushion you're using and its prehistory. Uh, Greg, back to you. Um, we're running a little short on time here, so we will get back to the people who asked the other questions uh, personally. Again, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to send them in to us. Uh, our fifth presentation on this will be on September 24th, wrapping up the five the five sections of the package dynamic series. Our next webinar um, will be on August 20th on medical device packaging, common test failure modes, and solutions. You can check our website under the resources tab for more information. You can register for there from there or wait for the pre, your personal invitation to come in your inbox. Um, we have two locations one in San Jose and one in San Diego, California. Please don't hesitate to contact either site if you have questions or want to follow up on the webinar. If you missed anything or would like to listen to the webinar again, please go to our Westpac website at www.westpac.com under the Resources Webinar tab. The materials will be uploaded shortly. We will be sending out a short survey following the webinar. Please fill it out as we highly value your opinion and are always looking to improve our process. You also have the opportunity to ask questions or suggest new webinar topics there. Thank you for attending. I'm Greg Swinghammer. Make it a great day.